Sister McPherson made her way through that little door to come out here on the platform, and our memories still live around here, I'm sure. I take a little vacation about three days and went out in Florida fishing and trying to rest up my voice a little bit. <clears throat> so I had quite an experience down there. I thought maybe I might just kind of pass it on to you tonight. We'd been fishing and back in the Ogachovi swamps and I'd caught a nice string of fish. And there was one of the brothers that was with me that Brother Evans from Tifton, Georgia. He had a brother that lived down there in the, near the swamp, and he fished in the swamp all the time. And he'd been after me some time to go down. So recently, I was at Brother Thea Jones's place, and that morning I was to have breakfast with with Brother Evans. While I was getting ready to leave the room, I saw a vision of Brother Evans trying to hide a sack of fish from a game warden. <laughs> so I, I said, Brother Evans, I don't want to hurt your feelings, but where you fish at is kind of like bios, isn't it? He said, that's right. I said, you and two of your boys and another fellow was down there just recently, and he had a sack full of fish, and he was afraid that the game warden was going to catch you, and you hid them fish five times before he got out of there. And he said, that's right, exactly. So... His brother had been fishing a week or two before that, and, or a month or two, pardon me, and uh, he got bit by a ground rattler. That's a little different rattler from the diamond back you have here, but he's very poisoned. I guess the boy's body's swollen twice its size, and they had him under medical treatment. He was a sinner, not a Christian. So he had an awful time. He'd come back out in his legs and casts from where the snake had, they thought they might have to amputate that leg, it was so bad. Now while we were out there, his Christian brother was fishing along by the side of me and I had a big fish on the line, and just a small pole and I walked him up and down the bio trying to land him and when I got him more out up the edge of the weeds, why, Mr. Evans said, just a moment brother Branham and he pulled off his shoes and rolled up his trouser leg, said, I'll catch it for you. And he ran out, and as he started out, a big old rusty rattler grabbed him. And he let out a scream and run back to the bank and said, felt like that the bone in his leg had just turned to ice. It was aching so hard. Well, if anyone knows what a snake bite is, you get sick right away. So I thought, well, if I had to pack him those two miles, he much larger man than I, how was it going to get him out of that swamp? And it just come to me then this scripture, and they shall tread on the heads of serpents and scorpions. And I said, just a moment, Brother Evans, I, and put my hand over on the place where the two fangs had went in, the little blood oozing out of the f holes where the rattler had bit him. I said, Heavenly Father, your word, in your word, it says that they shall tread on the heads of serpents and it shall not harm them. I no more than said that till he must have been standing by somewhere and he heard the word quoted and the, all the pains left immediately. We fished the rest of the day, went in that night and his brother said, you get to the hospital just quick as you can. He said, because all, it might break loose any time. And his Christian brother said, if God has cared for me this far, he'll take me the rest of the way through. And he's never had any ill feelings of it yet. The Lord Jesus did that. It pays to be a Christian. The sinner was bitten and almost died. The Christian was bitten and didn't not even have to have medical attention. Goes to show that every word in God's book is true. Every Word, every chapter, every verse, every line is the truth. Now, I, they have been so nice to me here at the temple. They told me just to do as the Lord led me. You couldn't want any better than that, could you? And so I said, well, we'll, some nights we'd talk to the congregation and try to build their faith. And then 
start their prayer lines and pray for the sick and just whatever the Spirit says to do, we'll try to do that. Tonight I thought being tired and just got in, I'd just speak to you a while tonight from the Word, not keep you long and just so we can get this meeting started. And then if I believe that Los Angeles is ready for an old-fashioned revival. I've always believed that God had never turned Los Angeles loose yet. He's still got his hand here. There's so much goes with this. And like this temple here that was built upon prayer and tears and sacrifice and God just can't forget those things. And men and women today who are laboring to keep it that way. Let's put our shoulders with them, the visitors with me. Let's do everything that we can to get in the sick and the afflicted and the sinners. If we'll get the sinners saved, a revival will start breaking through. For that's the main thing. God heals the sick. We know that. We're not worried about that. He'll do that. But to get... Sinners saved is what we want to start with. Now, just before we read the word, uh, let's speak to the author as we bow our heads, if you will. <clears throat> Most gracious Father, it is a grand privilege to know that we can begin this service tonight just in scriptural order. For in the scriptures we read that music went before the battle. They played the songs and then the Ark of the Covenant followed and then the fight was on. And tonight after the most lovely music has been played and the songs has been sung, now we shall bring the word. And then may the battle be on. We pray, O oh God, that the angels of God will take their positions in every corner and at every aisle and at every seat in this building. May there be such old-time conviction until there cannot be one person walk in this building a sinner and go out the same thing. May whosoever comes in unsaved May God save them for the glory of his kingdom. We pray also, Lord, that you would remember those that are sick and needy, that are afflicted and needs thy power of healing so graciously in their bodies. They want to work for you and they have no doubt made many promises and concentrated themselves to thee and in their consecration that they have made great promises that they would do certain things. Hear their prayers, Lord. May this be a time of visitation to them. Bless the temple and all that it stands for and its workers. And we pray, Lord, that you'd send an old-time revival like used to be when its founder lived and walked in and out of this building. There is such a thing as she being able to hear tonight and to look in upon this scene. I'm sure that would be her heart's desire to see another revival in this city to which she loved and labored and with the people. Grant it, Lord, and we'll Close our eyes and bow our heads and give thee praise. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Just from a quotation of the word here that come on my mind, I would like to read a very familiar scripture known to the, I would say, the least of the little uh, Kindergarten school. John 3.16. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish and have everlasting life. And then in the 22nd Psalm and the 11th verse, I would like to read this. Be not far from me, for our trouble is near, and there is none to help. Now, I'd like to take for a text tonight five words and just dwell with them a few moments. One of them is living, and dying is the second one, buried is the third one. Rising is the fourth one. Coming is the fifth one. Living, dying, buried, rising, coming. That's enough to keep me here until in the morning. But and then not nothing like justify the text. But we'll just speak on each one for a few moments. I think that these words that David wrote here when he wrote this 22nd Psalm begins with the crying of Christ at Calvary. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The reason that I chose this Easter has just passed and the people are still feeling the impact of that great of day, of when God proved that Jesus was his son by raising him up on the third day, according to the scriptures. And in living, he was loved. The poet expressed it when he said, living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away, rising he justified freely forever. Someday he's coming. Oh, glorious day. And when he lived, he loved. Because he was God, and God is love. And there could never be anyone who could love like Jesus loved. From the very first time his little baby hand stroked those pretty cheeks of his Beautiful mother, he was loved from that till he forgave his last enemy on the cross. He was God's expression of love. No one could love like Jesus. God being manifested in a little tiny baby, come in order to take away the sins of the world. And when you just speak of the word Jesus, say something about it, means love. That's what the world needs more today is not a a Jesus of some past tense, some Jesus of some high ethics, but a Jesus of love that can be expressed in the church of the Lord Jesus, especially as his members one to another ought to always greet one another in love. In traveling, I think if there's any great thing that I've seen missing in the church today to one of the greatest hindrance in the church today to keep a revival back is the lack of that godly love that Christ expressed when he was here on earth. It's easy for you and I to love somebody that loves us. But Jesus didn't have that kind of love. He had God's love, and God loved his enemies, for God so loved the world. When the world was unlovable, God still loved the world. It's a different, even in the expression, in the, the words, the, the a filial love, like we have one for another. But the agapo love is a divine love. And if there's anything that I believe that would start a revival, 
in Los Angeles would be a time that we could all break down our different barriers and come together as Christians in love. That's the Pentecostals, the Baptists, and the Presbyterians, and all together we could be expressed to the world that we have love one for another. Jesus prayed that prayer that we might love one another as he loved us, as he loved us. And he loved us so much that he died for us. No one could love like that unless they with the natural um, love because it would not hold out it won't express itself it'll do as long as there's friendship connected with it but when the friendships turn then the people begin to say well he did so and so she did so and so they backslid they real godly love goes after that backslider till it finds him Godly love goes and stoops to the lowest of hell to pick up a man or a woman that's fallen. That's what we're lacking today. We have a fine, cultured church, educated, fine dressed, fine buildings, nice choirs, beautiful music, some of the best the world's ever had, but we are dying for some of that godly love. Jesus expressed it well when he found the prostitute drugged before him guilty of an adultery. And they drug her before him and said, Now the law requires for her to die. What do you say do about it? I tell you, he showed himself what he was when he turned with these words. Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. What more love could be than to take a wayward person like that and see who he was and freely forgive the woman of her wrong. He expressed it again greatly when he was dying at Calvary. In his last words at the cross, and his enemy spirit, hanging on his face he cried father forgive them for they know not what they do no one could love like him you can't manufacture that kind of a love it's a the gift of God that comes by the Holy Spirit the only way you'll ever be able to have that love though I speak with tongues of man and angels and have not that kind of a love I am nothing Though I have faith to move mountains. The Bible said, I was speaking here a few days ago upon the scripture, straight is a gate and narrow is a way, and but few there will be that find it. And a young man who was riding with me in a car said, how many would you say would be saved in this generation? I said, eight or ten. Oh, he said, don't say that, brother. I say, I'll length it to 50, and that's as many as I can go. He said, 50 people? I said, Jesus said when he was on earth, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Days of Noah, there was eight souls saved. I remember a generation fades out each day. Ends that generation. Take 50 a day for 6,000 years and see what you've got. And he said, well then, Brother Branham, I'd like to ask you this question. All the people that's claimed to have the Holy Spirit and so forth, won't they come in the resurrection? I said, if they had the Holy Spirit. But what we've been putting too much emphasis on is on other things instead of on the real thing, the love of God. Paul said, all these things could happen. I could have all wisdom, all knowledge, and yet have not love. It profit me nothing. I could speak with tongues like men and angels and still not have it. And we put so much emphasis upon these things, upon great healing revivals and miracles being worked. Did not Jesus say, many will come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord, have not I cast out devils in your name? In your name have I not done many mighty works? 
I will say unto them, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I did not even know you. What a disappointment that will be. But look what a surprise it will be when he said those who didn't even think they deserved to be there. When were you hungry and we fed you? When were you naked and we gave you clothes? We didn't know when you did this. He said, in so much as you've done it unto these, you've done it unto me. Oh, how the world needs something today. I'll give you a little expression to clear that up. In Ezekiel, the ninth chapter, I believe it is, when the Holy Spirit was sent forth to seal the people that would go in that day. He said, go through the city. And put a mark upon the forehead of those that sigh and cry for the abominations that's did in the midst of the city. Then to the slaughtering angels go after them. And utterly destroy everything that doesn't have this seal. Now you take it in your own mind and go through Los Angeles tonight. And you mark in the name of the Lord Jesus every person that's so concerned about the sins of the city until they cry and sigh day and night for the abominations done. Bring me eight here tomorrow night. All right, you see where we go. We let other things come in to take up the place of the real thing. It's love we're leaving out. Living, he loved me. He died for me when I was a sinner. When I was unlovable, he loved me anyhow. My prayer is for the church that we can have such love till we love people whether they love us or not. That's what the church needs today is to express a love even to a man that can spit in your face. And you could still, with not from a hypocritical standpoint, but from your heart, pray for that man's soul. That's the kind of a revival we need here in Los Angeles. With that kind of a love manifested, living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Most wonderful life that was ever lived on earth had to die when he was yet in his youth. For God had spoken his his judgments had had to have justice. For it is written, the day you eat thereof, that day you die. God's justice required death. And there was no one of us could die for one another. No man could do that. He was the only man could die that kind of a death. For we were all born in sin, shaped in iniquity, come to the world speaking lies. We were guilty from the beginning. So how could a good man die for another man when he was guilty himself? There could not be any of us take that kind of a position. So it had to take his death. And God came down and was manifested in the flesh. In order to die a death, God could not die in spirit. Because God is eternal. And spirit doesn't die. But he was God. And he had to unfold himself and and come from glory to a manger. And take on the form of sinful flesh. In order to die... To secure his church or to redeem his church. To reconcile him back to himself. Oh, brother, sister, there's nobody could explain that. What God did when he died for us. His flesh was put to death. In the scriptures, in the Old Testament, at the sin offering, when they got two goats... And these goats and Jesus represented both of them. Or they represented him rather. And one goat was killed. And the other was the sins of the nation was placed upon this goat called the scapegoat. And that goat had to go out into the wilderness to die. 
and to be out there alone amongst the beast and so forth. Jesus had to be that, that goat. I want you to notice he was a lamb. He was sheep. But he was made goat for you and I. That we being goat might become sheep. We being sinners. Guilty of death. Subject to death. And all sold out under condemnation. Yet Christ become me. That I through his grace might become him. A son of God. Seated at the right hand of God. In glory. Love that he had, how he expressed it, how he had to make himself what he was to die to save us. In his death, when he died at Calvary, there was never a death could be like that death. We are told that when the Roman soldier pierced his side, there was water and blood came out of his side. And I've asked a chemist one time, what taken place from that? And this fellow being a Christian said to me, that was not, Jesus did not die because that the spear touched his side or pierced his side. Said Jesus had been dead a long time before that, but he died from grief. The sword never killed him, or neither did this, the uh, driving of the nails. But it was grief that killed him. When he looked out upon the ones that he had loved, and the ones that he had worked his miracles on, and the ones that he had expressed his love towards, and had fed, and see that they turned him down. You and I might be grieved. We might grieve, but we can never grieve like that because we're not made up of that kind of material that we could have that much grief. For the fullness of God dwelt in him. In him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. God was expressing his love through human flesh, the tabernacle in which he lived in his own son, what he thought about the world. There he hung there on Calvary's cross, not as you see him on the crucifix, with the little rag wrapped around his loins. They stripped him naked. They embarrassed him to everything that they could embarrass him to. And hung him there on Calvary. And he was disgraced and despised and rejected and spit on him. There he hung dying. The God of eternity, the one that made the cross he was hanging on. No wonder the rocks ran out of the mountains. The rocks come out because the rock of ages was being erected. No wonder the poet said, mid rendering rocks and darkening skies, my Savior bowed his head and died. The opening veil revealed the way to heaven's joys and endless day. What did it do when he died there like that? It opened the veil. It let us look past the curtain of time. Let us see a, a hope there. When I see him bruised and, and mashed and spit and thorns and nails drove through him. What did it do? It opened the way that me, a guilty sinner, I know that he paid the price there. I'm not justified by anything I could do. None of my goodness I have none. Neither do you. But it's through his sacrifice, it's through his death, we are justified by believing on him. There's where our justice stands. Not what I do or what you do, but what he did for us. That ain't the gospel story. I don't know it. Oh, give me that and take all the rest of it away. See that one who died for me. How could I be just? I, I cannot justify myself. I'm a sinner. But when I look up on him and come singing, nothing in my arms I bring simply to thy cross I cling. There's where I'm justified by my faith, believing that he died in my stead and took my place at Calvary. That's alone where I stand on the platform when demon powers are around. And I see death hanging on the people and 
the devils got them bound and possessed and some of them in straight jackets and, and guards around them. What do I stand on then? I look to Calvary and Lord there. Jesus Christ paid the price. I feel religious. There he did it. That person's got a right to be free. Satan don't hold him no longer. If you can get them to see not their aches and their pains or some preacher praying for them or some holy church, that's all right. That goes with it. But the main thing, you see what Christ did for you. You're free. Christ died for you. Amen. That's the gospel. Mid rendering rocks and darkening skies. My Savior bowed his head and died. The opening veil revealed the way. The heaven's joy and endless day. There's where he died. Living he loved me. Dying he saved me. How could I be saved? Get rid of sin. He was a sin offering for me. So he died. Now if sin is dead, then buried, he carried my sins far away. He was a scapegoat. That went out and the scapegoat took the sins of the people on him and went out into the wilderness to be to die go out there and tuck the sins of the people and tuck them far away so did jesus he was he, he took the sins of the people and carried them far away so far that he put them in the sea of god's forgetfulness if sin is dead bury it that's why we have babstries when people believe that story, they come confessing their sins, that they're tired of it. They've divorced it. They've separated from it. And they're tired of it, so it's dead. And sin has a more power upon that believer because he stands justified in the death and burial of Jesus Christ. Therefore, he walks to the altar, makes his confession, and says, I'm sick and tired of sin. I don't want it no more. Then we bury it. When sin is buried, anything is buried, it's, it's dead first. Then it's buried. It's put away from sight. That's why we bury people. We put them away from the sight. The contamination of their bodies. Hide them from us. It's a gloomy thing to see what death does. And when sin is finished, when sin lost its grips and it died in the death of Christ at Calvary where he condemned sin, then the sinner who accepts that justified by faith can scream hallelujah for God's carried my sins far away he put them up on my sin barrier Jesus Christ he represented both the animals both dying and taking the sins away then as I said a few moments ago he become we become we were goats he become goat for us being he becomes sin for us that's the reason he had to be punished the way he was. Because all of our sins were placed upon him. And there he had to bear them away in his own body to Calvary. A reproach, a disgrace. Sinfully hanging there, naked, stripped, bleeding, bleeding. He rolled his precious head around the bloody locks dripping. From his shoulders, I believe it was Billy Sunday, said there was an angel sitting in every tree saying, just pull your hands loose from the cross and just motion your finger, we'll change the scene. The Jews paid him the greatest compliment could be paid, not knowing what they were doing. They said he saved others, himself he can't save. Sure not. If he saved himself, he could not save others. But he gave himself that we might be saved. That's the story. Living he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. They're done. They're finished. God, see a forgiveness to be remembered against us no more. Oh, can't we shout hallelujah to that? Sure, it's all over. Christ did it. Oh, my, sure we can. Now, here comes the greatest of all. Rising, he justified. All these great things he done was wonderful. They're superb. There's nothing to be added to it. But yet a man could die. Yet a man could suffer. Yet a man could love. But when he rose, God wrote the receipt in his resurrection that he had received it. God's justice had been met. 
Oh, thanks be to God. Rising, he justified. God proved by the resurrection that he wasn't frowny, he wasn't fake, that was his son. And he raised him up, the Spirit, the eternal Spirit, Jehovah God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who raised up that dead form in the grave there had been dead for three days and buried, and God raised him up on Easter morning to justify there when we come, brother, coming to God, there's not one thing. He that cometh must come boldly to the throne of grace. You mustn't come wandering. When you come into the prayer line, you mustn't come wondering, well, if this minister will pray for me, perhaps maybe he's got healing power. Brother and sister, healing power is in God. It's in cross, in the finished work of Calvary. When you come, come to be justified. You are justified when you confess your faith that by stripes I was healed. I'm going to make a stand. The doctor says I'm dying. I got tumor. I got TB. Whatever it is. But tonight I stand because I believe that he loved me and died for me and saved me and buried my sins far away. And God justified us by believing on him when he raised him up from the dead. He accepted everything that he died for. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace up on him, and with his stripes we were healed. And he raised him up and wrote the receipt. That was God's receipt. When the earth began to quiver and shake, and the sun began to dark, or light the earth on that Easter morning, heaven shook, hell shook, paradise shook, the earth shook. Something has taken place. I can hear the angels in glory screaming. Hallelujah! I can hear them in paradise, the old saints of the Old Testament, crying out glory to His name. Certainly, something had happened when up from the grave He arose. He brought out the triumph over the grave. Death, hell, sickness, every barrier, everything... That stands in the way of perfect freedom for the Christian. Everything that you have need of was taken care of. It was done, been suffered for, done, been accepted, done, bled for, done, died, done, rose. And God justified him. He justifies you to believe it. Up from the grave he arose. Proved that he was God. Buddha made some great statements. Buddha died in the grave 2,300 years ago. Still there. Mohammed made a lot of great statements, but he died and he's in the grave and been there for about nearly 1,900 years. He's in the grave. No speaking afterwards. They might have been great men. Confucius, the great Chinese philosopher, many of those great men, poets and authors and gods and what more, they might have been great in their stand. But when God raised up His Son on Easter morning, it proved it and He sent the Holy Ghost and we've got the receipt of it now. But I can hear Him scream from eternity because I live, ye live also. Amen. That's right. Because I live, you live also. Amen. For he was wounded for our transgressions with his stripes we were healed. You don't have to die before your time comes. Because he lives, you live also. When death shall smother out my breath, I'll still be living. He that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me has everlasting life and shall never come to the judgment, but pass from death unto life. I am the resurrection of life, saith God. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. I anchor my soul right there. No wonder the poet wrote, On that bright and cloudless morning, When the dead in Christ shall rise, And the glory of his resurrection share, When his chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the sky, When the rose called up yonder, I'll be there. Why? Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. Someday he's coming. 
Oh, glorious day. I can see my shoulders stooping. My arms where they used to be muscles are getting fat. And, and I, oh, I can see I'm, I'm dying. I don't know how long it'll be before he'll call me. But I've got eternal life in here because he died for me that he might redeem this that I have offered to him. Some glorious day he's coming. I believe it with all my heart. I'll stay at the battlefield by his grace. I'll preach, pray for the sick until death shall set me free. And then go home a crown to wear. For he paid for it, gave it freely. God justified my belief when he raised up Jesus. Then I have a crown waiting. Forty days after he had visited his disciples, he's standing out on the mountain. You know, gravitation is what holds us on the earth. When we're on the earth here, it's gravitation holds us. But you know what? God took an ocean for him to come up a little higher. Gravitation began to lose its hold. God, I hope that I can be that way some of these days. Don't you? On this old earthbound condition, sometimes I've been in meetings that I thought it was going to take place at any time. Just feel it breaking loose around you. One of these days it'll do it. No matter they can put you in a grave and put a tombstone on top of you and seal you up, that won't have one thing to do with it. The trumpet of God shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise. Some days coming. Oh, glorious day. Yes, he's coming. Gravitation begin to lose its hold. His feet begin to rise. Earth begin to peep through beyond that. I will come again, he said, and receive you into myself, that where I am, there you may be also. I'm so glad that I can sing that song with a true heart tonight. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. Someday he's coming. Oh, glorious day. Brings me to this little thought. I don't know where I ever said it, told this little story that I read out of a book one time about a man here in America. His name is Greenfield. He's been dead now about 75 years, I guess. He died. Oh, I guess he, maybe longer than that. But before he died, he dreamed a dream that he went to glory. When he got up there, he went to the gate and he said to the saint, I am Danny Greenfield. He said, I'm an evangelist. I come to take my position. He said, just a moment, sir. Your name has to be on the book here. He looked over the book and he said, there's no Greenfield, Daniel Greenfield. Here he said, oh, you must be wrong, sir. He said, I was an evangelist in America. He said, nope, it's not here. He said, what can I do? He said, if you wish to, you might appeal your case to the great white throne judgment. So he said, that's all I have left. So he said, it seemed like he was passing through the air for a while. Begin to get lighter and lighter. After a while, as it got lighter, he got slower till he stopped. He couldn't see just where the light was coming from, but it's all around him. And said he heard a voice that said, Who is this that approaches my throne of justice? He said, I'm Daniel Greenfield. Said, I was up at the heaven gates, and the, the gatekeeper turned me away and said, I have to stand before your judgment, and I appeal my case to stand here, sir. He said, All right, I'll judge you by my justice then. He said, my justice requires perfection. He said, did you ever lie when you was on earth? He said, I thought I'd been an honest man and had been truthful. But said in the presence of that light, I've seen a lot of times I've told things that wasn't right. Look, friend, we may go to church every Sunday. We may be very religious. Oh, sure, you might pay your tithes and you might just be as good a person as Los Angeles as God. That may be true. But I tell you, there's a lot of things going to stand before you if that's all you got when you stand at that white throne judgment. No wonder if you there will be, you'll be saved. And he said, I thought I told the truth, but said, I seen a lot of things I told wasn't just right. He said, yes, I, I told lies. He said, then did you ever steal? He thought, there's one I can answer. But said in the presence of that light, he saw many little shady deal. He never thought of it in natural life. See, we're just on the negative side. We're looking with shaded eyes. But when we stand there in his presence, 
the glasses are going to be pulled off, we'll see face to face with him then. That's when it's going to be terrible. And he said, yes, I, 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 I guess I did steal. He said, Daniel Greenfield, my justice requires perfection. Was you perfect when we used you in your life? He said, no, Lord, I wasn't perfect. He said, he's waiting to hear that great bless. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. He said, he heard a voice. It's the sweetest voice he ever heard in his life. And he turned to look. He said he saw the sweetest face that he ever saw. Said no mother could look or talk like that. Said as he walked up close to him, he put his hand up on his shoulder. And he said to him, Father, that is true, Danny Greenfield, in his earthly journey. He wasn't perfect. But there's one thing he did when he was on earth. He stood for me. Now while you're in heaven... I'll stand for him. All of his sins put it up on my account. And he had paid for it at Calvary. Brother, sister, that's the one I'm going to depend on. I'm not going to depend on whether I'm a Methodist or a Baptist or a Pentecostal. I'm not going to depend on whether I shouted, whether I spoke with tongues, whether I prayed the prayer of faith for the sick. I'm not going to depend on that. I'm going to depend on my faith yonder. Or he loved me and died and saved me and rising he justified. I'll stand for him upon the basis of that while I'm here on earth. And that great judgment morning, I believe he'll stand for me at that day. Who would stand for you that day? Could your pastor, could your church? Think of it while we bow our heads just a moment. Dear God, that is a solemn question that we must answer just now. Who would stand for us? Would it be the, our friends, though they might be ever so loyal and would try as hard as they could to stand for us? It might be our beloved pastor who we love with all of our hearts and he would stand and scream for us. Yet he has to scream for mercy too. Oh, there was, could be no one stand that day but Jesus Dear God, I've just tried to speak of a love that you gave to your church. It seems like that they've caught up with the miracles of the Bible. They've caught up with the, the membership and the evangelism and the missionaries. And, but Lord, let them catch up with love now. That'll set the church afire with a real agape love, with a real sacred love that could turn the cheek or the one that would be willing to lay down his life if it would mean to save others God give us that love in our hearts as we wait on thee while we have our heads bowed I wonder tonight how many in this big audience of people tonight would just like to stand up to your feet and say I'm going to stand right now for Jesus and by doing this Lord I want you to stand for me on that day because this may be the last chance that I get to ever stand for you. I've been in many meetings. I'm a member of a church. Maybe you are, maybe you're not. Whatever the case is, would you just say, Lord, I'll stand right now and please stand for me on that day. Stand up to your feet right now while we offer prayer. Just raise up. That's right. God bless you. That's just fine. All right. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified. Freely forever. Someday he's coming, oh glorious day. The chaplain sitting out here tonight. As in a great meeting of science the other day. You all seen the, I believe it's a Look magazine this month. How that general said that this next war will just only be a few minutes. Right now, it just takes one of them to blow their top and some of these, excuse that expression, but some of these arguments they're having, just set off one bomb. There we are out there in the ocean with these submarines to rise up. There they are in different places to send those bombs. Here they come this way, here they come that way. The world can't stand it. She could go in there. Before that clock strikes another two minutes, this entire thing could be over. Don't you take a chance. If you're not sure you're right, 
I wonder if our sister would give us a card on this. Do you believe that God would hear my prayer for you? Come here, let me, uh, uh, you're out of them lights out there. Walk down here just a minute, will you? Come right here, let's stand here and pray together. Come right on now, if you will. Don't sit down. Just move right up here and stand here. Say, I've been a church member. I'm not ashamed. I'll come right up here and stand here. I want to come. I want to be honest. We're, you'll see a revival start. If you can just see the Spirit of God get into the people. God bless you. If you hear my prayer to open the eyes of the blind, no doubt you'll see that done these next few days. Make the poison of a snake bite through prayer. Just stop it. Dead still. I've seen those who had passed beyond mortal life. The doctors had closed their eyes and folded their hands and walked away. See them rise back to life again. What? Through prayer. Prayer means something. We'll wait for you in the balconies. Come right on down. Let's stand here and have a prayer together. Would you come right down? Let's, let's pray together. That's what we want to do. How many like to have that love? If you haven't got a love in your heart tonight, that you sigh and cry for the abominations that's did in this city. Listen, friends, I'll ask, take any student here to, to, to discuss that. The scripture said that the angel of God could only seal those who wept and cried for the abomination did in the city. All that has read that say amen. There it is. Just those who sigh and cry for the abomination of the city. Or oh, you say, I've been a Pentecostal a long time. That's good. So have I. But brother, what about that spirit of concern about the lost world if you're about the Father's business? You say, well, I, I, I get a blessing every night. And if that good, humble, sweet, meek spirit isn't on you, what is the fruits of the spirit? Love, peace, joy, long-suffering, goodness, gentleness, patience. Don't take no chance. In the morning may be too late. An hour from now may be too late. Why don't you come now? Before there's any healing service, before there's anything, come right down and say, Lord, I want to get right. I want a spirit in me that will make me love. I want a spirit in me that will make me appreciate what Jesus did for me in so much that my heart will be tender and loving and I can forgive the people from my heart, not because it's a duty. Now, there's some of in the balcony should be coming down. Walk out. You might just be that many steps between you and heaven. I don't say it is. I hope it isn't. But it might be just that much is all you need. What would you give tonight? If Jesus, if you'd hear something take place and a rock would go off down here somewhere, one back here and the radios would be screaming, people running into the streets and the atomic bombs would fall into... What, it's too late then. You know what would happen? The church would, the gravitation would take, leave his hope loose. That church would be raptured just as certain as I'm standing in this pulpit. The graves would open, the dead would come out. They'd go to meet the Lord Jesus. Church members by the tens of thousands, yes, by the tens of millions, will be left behind. Better come, be sure that you've got love in your heart. While we bow our heads just a moment, while we're waiting as others are coming down, let the personal workers get around now also. And you are coming around to pray with us. Come on, sinner friend. Come on, backslider. Come on, lukewarm church member. Let's, let's go to heaven together. You come where I'm here now for this prayer. I want to pray for you. I want to be sure that I've done everything that I can do. Because I'm believing that this week is going to be a is going to be in this coming week is going to be a great time around this temple if Jesus tarries. And I'd like to see every sin cleaned up. I'd like to see all the old gloomy devils tuck away and the church of the living God could stand on their feet with real divine love. There'll be a shaking through this city like it's never been known before. Lame, blind, halt, everything would take place. Are you finished? You're sure now. This, this is, you're sure that your sins are so under the blood and you have such a desire in your heart for the sins of this city that you nightly, nightly you can weep to God. Oh, God. And through the daytime, you look and see the people living the way they are in sin. It brings tears to your cheeks and and sorrow to your heart as you look and just see how sinful it is. 
Is that the kind of spirit's in you? That's the only kind that's sealed by the Holy Spirit. That's exactly what the Scripture says. The ones that were sealed with the Holy Spirit had that kind of a spirit in them. And what is the fruit of that spirit? Love, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, patience, peace, at peace with everyone. Where they disagree with you, that's all right. That's the kind of a church we want. That's the kind of people we want to be. Don't be ashamed now. Maybe before morning, you may call him to stand for you. What would he say? You know I spoke to you when that preacher was saying that last night at the Angeles Temple. Why didn't you come on down there? You turned down your last day. Well, he said, Brother Branham, I've been a church member. Jesus said they will come and even say, guys like... Tommy Osborne, Oral Roberts, William Branham, all the rest of them. It goes out and has healing services. Many of those guys will stand in that day and say, Lord, I, I cast out devils in your name. I did great works in your name. You say, I never even knew you. See, those gifts will work through faith. But love perfects. That's, love is what does it. Love is what welts, melts us with God. Makes us one in unity, one in heart, one in spirit. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Can I appreciate him? Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified. Freely forever. Now what am I doing? Waiting for someday he'll come. Oh, that glorious day. Um, say, let it be tonight, Lord. If it be your will, let it be tonight. All right. How many out there now... Right before the audience, the neighbors sitting next to you say, Brother Branham, I haven't got the nerve to rise up and go up there. I wish I did. I know I haven't got that kind of spirit in me. The one that you're speaking about, the kind that Jesus had, the kind of love he had, the kind of sacrifice he gave, that spirit was in him, has to be in me. Make me act meek, gentle, patience, love, long-suffering, gentleness. I haven't got it, Brother Branham. I got a temper. I've never been sanctified from that. I... I, I I got doubts in my mind. There's something wrong. Sure, when the Holy Spirit comes in, it takes a place and roots all that out. Every root of bitterness is gone. Then you're sweet towards everyone. Love everybody. That's the way you are. You say, I haven't got that. I haven't even got the nerve to, to rise up. But I have got this much courage left. I'm going to raise my hand to God and say, God, I can't exactly stand for you now. I haven't got that much courage. But remember me, O oh Lord. Would you raise your hands out in the audience there? It hasn't come up. God bless you. Now, you standing here, each one of you, I want you solemnly with all your heart to know that you've made this consecration. I don't just come down the aisle just because it's just, you come just because, well, I, I don't want to go to hell. Of course you don't. But I come, Jesus, because that something touched me in my heart. I see what you did for me. And I haven't got that what you require. And I'm coming to receive it. I want it. Why do you receive a substitute? Why take a church membership or, or some little excitement? Or, now, I believe in excitement and shouting and speaking in tongues and, and divine healing. I believe all those things. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about God first. You could have that and not have God. Paul said you could. Jesus said many will come and say they had it, confessing they had it, but they didn't have this. See, that's where we're lacking. I need love, Lord. I need your spirit in my heart to make me that kind of a person. Tender, kind, gentle, humble, forgiving. That's what I want. And Lord, I'm bowing my head right before you now to say this. Lord, change my life right now. I open myself up and say, now, Lord, I'm nothing, but you change me. It's got to be you. My emotions has brought me to this altar. But now it takes your spirit to change me. Come do it, Lord. Come place in me that glorious longing. That's what it is. I said to a man the other day, oh, I, I believe Jesus will come most any time. He said, don't talk about that, Brother Branham. You weary me. I said, where are you? said, sure, I'm making more money now than I ever made in my life. My business is better. I said, then, brother, you claim you're a Christian and would fear the coming of the Lord?
greatest moment I could think of. The coming of the Lord. That's the greatest thing that I can think of. That's why I'm here now is because I believe He's coming. The most, that's the carnation of my day. It's right when I can see Him. And all those that love His appearing, Paul said, there was laid up a crown of righteousness. All that love His appearing. Come, Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord, come now. This is the hour. If it's so please Thee, Lord. That's the way to feel about it. And loving me, dying for me, buried for me, rising he justified freely forever. Now I'm looking for you to come, Lord. And I want to have the same kind of spirit in me that you had in you. I want that kind of a spirit that if my enemy's spit could be hanging from my face. And with all my heart, I could say, I forgive you for it. And I could forgive others as, Christ, as God for Christ's sake forgave us. All right, let us bow our heads now in prayer. Billy, if you don't mind, I wish you would come here with me. I want you to take the after service, one of you, if you will. As you bow your heads, I want you to confess to God that you've been wrong. And you want God to forgive you now and to place in you. Hear me, people. Just as sure as I'm standing here... He wants to do it. Now look, how'd you come? No man can come to me except my father draws him first. Why you get up and come? Because you know there's something wrong. Now you're at the altar where all wrongs are right. And because there's a, a sacrifice laying on the altar for you. What was it? A bleeding sacrifice. The Son of God. The Christ, Father, forgive them. They didn't mean to do that. Now you look upon that as we pray. Lay your hands by faith upon his head. Just imagine you now. You've done wrong. Like in the Old Testament, they brought a lamb, put his, put the hands up on the lamb and cut the lamb's throat. And the little fellow as it quivered and bladed and died and blood going all over the worshiper's hands, he realized that that was, he, he should be dying. But the lamb was dying for him. Now by faith, lay your hands on the head of Jesus. And feel that suffering, that forsaken, until blood and water separated. Feel that suffering and say, Lord God, upon the basis of this, I now come as a sinner. Be merciful to me. Dear God, as I realize my position standing here, by this sacred desk... I'm standing between death and life to men and women that I'll have to meet over there at that great morning. Oh, I might pray for someone, they get well and forgotten. But Lord, here's souls at stake. And I've got to stand with them beyond any shadow of doubt before the just and living God and give an account for the ministry. And here they are, Lord. They've come because they have believed and they, the Holy Spirit has condemned them that they've been doing wrong and they come now to make that right. And I pray for them. That's all I know how to do, Lord, is to say what the Word says here. And now they're confessing their wrong. And if they're willing to confess God, God is going to forgive. He promised to. And to give unto them the desire of their heart. For it is written, He will withhold no good thing from them that will walk upright before Him. They want to have a spirit of love in their heart. Father, we've had so much shouting. We've had so much joy. I'm afraid we forgot the main thing, Lord. Is Elijah standing at the mouth of the cave, hearing the winds and the thunders, but it never alarmed him. He waited for that still, small voice. Lord, speak now. Speak down into their hearts. That still, small voice. It says, child of mine, he that will come to me, I will in no wise cast out. 
I lay every sin you've done upon my own sacrifice, my only begotten Son. You confessing it because you believe that He was the only one who could help you. And He did that. And he, he, he justified every one of you by His suffering. And I proved it by raising Him up from the dead. And now I give unto you that spirit that was in Him that could forgive and could love and could be gentle and long-suffering and good and meek and kind and gentle and patient. God granted to them just now. And now when I come with them, Lord, down there at that day, this is all I know to do is to bring them here and ask you to do it and join my faith with them that you are doing it. That it's already done. And they're believing it and accepting it right now. In the bottom of their heart. I present them to you as love gifts. That the Holy Spirit has brought to Christ tonight. In the name of Jesus Christ. Now with your heads bowed. And you feel really ashamed of the way that you've done. Many of you confess Christianity and never had a burden like you should have had for lost souls. Maybe you've went to church. Maybe you've done certain things, good deeds. But now, you feel different about it. You feel like you're going out now that God has said something to your heart that you've you got more love for Him now. You, you see Him, what He is, what He's done for you. If you do, raise up your hand. All you around the altar say, I feel right now, God bless you. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. One hundred percent as far as I can see. That's it. That's it. It's nothing, not emotional. It's coming humbly, gently. Walking up, listening for that little voice. Yes, Lord. Then I receive you, Lord. Now I believe you. I believe you with all my heart. I'm going away from here tonight to be humble, gentle. I'm going away tonight feeling the burden in my heart for lost sinners. I'll be praying for sinners. I'll do everything that I can from this night henceforth. Now, if the congregation will bow their heads everywhere, I'm going to ask Brother Billy Adams if he'll continue the service. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's